Hi, and good evening, everyone. Welcome tonight to tonight's uh, Real Life Rounds webinar with Fat Girl. We're so excited to have with us tonight Dr. Susan Little, who will be presenting on Between a Rock and a Hard Place, Black Stones in Cats. We know how frustrating some of those can be. The voice you're hearing, that's me, Dr. Felicia Lung. Um, I'm the member of the Vet Girl team that will be moderating tonight's webinar. Um, I'll be behind the scenes answering some questions during the webinar, and I will also be asking um, Dr. Little some of the questions that you may have at the end of the webinar. And for our Vet Girl members, um, we're so glad you're joining us for our real life rounds. We hope that you will also be joining us with. Um, for some of our new tracks this year, we've added on the large animal track um, along with a leadership track as well as um, a technician track. And our leadership track was also, um, is also counts for continuing education requirements for the Certified Veterinary Practice Manager Program. So I wanted to make sure you guys were all aware of that. And just some logistics for tonight. Um, if you are attending this webinar live, you are getting active participation and you will get your half hour of CE credit with no quiz at all. And that CE certificate will be emailed to you in two hours after the conclusion of the webinar. And if you're watching this video later, unfortunately you guys must complete a very short quiz, um, but it shouldn't be any big deal. Uh, if you have any questions um, or if you don't receive your CE certificate by tomorrow morning, definitely check your spam mailboxes first. Um, otherwise, you can email our co-founders, Dr. Garrett Passinger at Garrett at ThatGirlOnTheRun.com or Dr. Justine Lee at Justine at ThatGirlOnTheRun.com. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Susan Little. If you wouldn't mind giving our Vet Girl audience a little introduction about yourself and go ahead and take it away. Uh, thanks, Felicia. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. This is uh, my first real life rounds for Vet Girl. I've done a number of webinars for Vet Girl before, but this is my first real life round, so that's kind of exciting for me. Um, so I won't spend a lot of time on introducing myself. I'll just say that I love cats. How's that? I'm a cat vet and I love cats. I have two cat only practices. Uh, in Ottawa, Canada, um, and I get to write and edit textbooks and uh, and work with cats all day. So that's uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, I'm talking to you uh, tonight for those of you who are with us live from uh, from Nova Scotia in Canada on the East Coast. So that's where I'm originally from, and I still have a home here, and a lot of my family's here. And it is a gorgeous summer evening um, here in Nova Scotia. So it's a, a, a beautiful time to be talking about uh, something that I think a lot of us are very keen on, and that is talking about bladder stones in cats. So that's what we're going to do in the next uh, 20, 25 minutes. Uh, before we get right into this, I do want to just give a tip of the hat to a couple of my colleagues. Most of the images that you're going to see in the presentation tonight are from my own patients, but a couple were shared with me uh, by colleagues. So I just want to give a, a thanks and a nod to Dr. Randolph Burrell and Dr. Um, Liz O'Brien, who were nice enough to share um, some of their uh, case images with me. So we're going to jump right in, <clears throat> and we're going to talk about diagnosis of bladder stones um, in cats tonight. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, the diagnostic part uh, because uh, that's actually, I think, where we need to spend a good bit of time. And then, of course, we're going to talk about the treatment part um, as, as well. So I thought I'd start this discussion by talking to you about one of my patients. So the, one of the patients we're going to talk about tonight is this lovely fellow whose name is Tommy. And at the time of this, uh, this story, anyway, Tommy's five years old, neutered male. He's a domestic short hair, lovely patient. He's been a patient of mine for a number of years. And uh, on this occasion, he's come into my practice because um, the owner says for the last, oh, about three days, she's noticed polacuria, dysuria, hematuria, and periary. Now, of course, that's not what she says, right? That's what we say. Those are the words we use. So she described um, him making frequent trips to the litter box and trying to avoid small amounts of urine. Um, and she did notice some uh, uh, blood in the urine in the litter box. And that's often the thing, 
right? Blood will drive people into the veterinary practice. Uh, blood from any orifice is, uh, you know, if you're a sick cat, you should get blood from some orifice because that's what will drive uh, clients into the, the veterinarian. So Tommy's owners are um, lovely people, but of course they didn't understand what was going on. And as soon as they saw blood in the urine, that became a matter of urgency to them. And so um, Tommy comes into the practice. So um, with that introduction, uh, I thought a good way to think about these cases that come in with these kind of generic lower urinary tract signs, because the, the signs that Tommy has could go with a number of lower urinary tract diseases. And so there's one big division we can make uh, <clears throat> for, for uh, possible causes, and that's on the basis of age. So if you're a cat like Tommy and you're under 10 years of age, if you're between 1 and 10 years of age, the, the two most common diagnoses for these generic lower urinary tract signs are idiopathic cystitis or urolis. So, of course, there are other causes of those lower urinary tract signs, but if we're talking, you know, playing the odds and statistics, then these are the two big ones. So we always want to start with what's statistically most likely and rule them in or out first, <clears throat> excuse me, before moving on to other uh, uh, possibly less common causes of lower urinary tract signs. <clears throat> I apologize a bit for my voice. It's, I'm in full allergy season <laughs> here on the East Coast, so my voice may be a little bit uh, um, iffy. Okay, so if we look at those two common causes uh, for a cat of Tommy's age, idiopathic cystitis and urolis, then there's really two types of tests that we want to do for this cat. We would like to get a complete urinalysis, and by complete, I mean we want to do our chemistries, we want to do urine-specific gravity, uh, we want to look at a sediment, we want cytology. I don't mean a culture. A culture we're going to save for other cases. Um, and we want survey radiographs. And as a matter of fact, if I had to um, make a, a choice, let's say an owner only had a limited amount of money because you know, hey, how common is that, right? That owners come in and they have a certain amount of uh, money that they can spend on their cat's problem. If I had to pick one of those things where I really had to conserve my client's money, I would do the survey radiographs and, 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 if, and I would save money by not doing the urinalysis. Now, obviously, I'd like both. That's more complete. But if we're thinking about um, a situation where an owner has limited means, if you think about it, the complete urinalysis is really cannot diagnose idiopathic cystitis and it can't diagnose urolifts. But the radiographs may diagnose urolifts. So if I really have to make a choice, that's the way I think about it. Okay, what about older cats? So if we have a cat come in who's over 10 years of age, then we have a different group of potential problems. So these cats, yes, still get urolifts. They're unlikely to have idiopathic cystitis, um, especially as a new diagnosis. Now, if they were a known uh, patient with idiopathic cystitis that started earlier in life and, and you, know, you knew that, then that still might be on their differential diagnosis list. But in, in, in these senior cats, idiopathic cystitis would be rare as a brand new diagnosis. So we're more likely thinking about urolis because they span the ages. Now we're thinking about potentially neoplasia. And we're also, this is the age group where we think about bacterial infection. And I just want to pause there for a minute and remind you that bacterial infection is actually really uncommon in cats with lower urinary tract disease. So if we look across all ages of cats with lower urinary tract signs, it's less than 5%. In some studies, it's less than 2% of cats have a bacterial infection. So cats have lots of defense mechanisms that protect them against bacterial infections that people don't have and that dogs don't have. So we always have to remember cats are quite different when it comes to many things, and one of them is lower urinary tract infections. So it's only when we get in this older age group where we start to see concurrent diseases that might predispose them to a urinary tract infection, like the cat with chronic kidney disease who has dilute urine-specific gravity, or the cat with diabetes, for example. Those are the cats that are much more likely to have urinary tract infections. So knowing that, when we look at these older cats, we want to do a little bit more complete workup because we're, we, have, we have to cast our net wider and we may actually need to find an underlying disease. So now with that urinalysis, we do want a urine culture. We would like to get some imaging and we will start, of course, with plain survey radiographs. We're going to talk a little bit more about ultrasound in a few minutes. But we'd also like to get some blood work done, so a minimum database, serum chemistries, at least a total T4. You might end, add on a complete blood count, 
kind of depending on what other clinical signs the cat has. But so you, you want some type of appropriate minimum database um, on, on these kitties as well that you'll, you'll decide based on um, their physical exam and their, and their history and their signalment and so on. So we're casting a, a, a much wider net in this group of kitties. So if we go back to, to Tommy, he's in the younger age group, so we want to get um, a urinalysis on Tommy, and we want to get some x-rays. So I'm going to show you first his urinalysis results. So just take a moment and have a look through there, what we found. So the urine was dark, kind of reddish yellow to the eye, um, specific gravity of 1045, pH of 6.4, a little bit of protein in there on um, cytology, one plus white cells, three plus red cells, and the occasional um, struvite crystal. So I just want you to think about that for a minute, okay, because I'm going to ask you a question now. So we're going to um, send a little survey to you and ask you, what is Tommy's most likely diagnosis? So I want you to think about what you've seen on those urinalysis results and think about what we talked about and let me know what you think the most likely diagnosis is for this kitty. So I'll just give a minute for this to, to work. <clears throat> I can see some of you are pretty sure of your answer there. Oh, now it's, uh, I'm watching the live results here and we're seeing a little bit of a shift. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I am going to send you the results of the survey. And you can see that about half of the people thought it could be idiopathic cystitis, about a third said urolith, and then the, other, the rest of you were kind of divided between he could have a UTI or, or I'm not sure. And actually, I would have answered that I'm not sure. Because on the basis of just that urinalysis alone, we really can't make a diagnosis. We're going to need to dig a little bit deeper. So I, I'm with a group of you who said, at this point, I'm not really sure what Tommy's most likely diagnosis is. So just a couple of more uh, words about um, uh, urinalysis in cats. Uh, we do prefer to get our urine sample by cystocentesis, so we avoid um, any contamination from the lower urinary tract. So I do want to remind you, too, that not all cats have to be in dorsal recumbency for cystocentesis. They can be standing. They can be sitting. Um, you can see in one of the images a kitty's kind of sort of half standing there because that's the position the cat feels more confident in, less fearful in. So, you know, thinking of uh, less stressful ways to do procedures with cats, we want the kitty to be comfortable. So you need to be a bit flexible in, uh, in your positioning for cystocentesis. Okay, so we do like to get our cystocentesis um, samples. And a couple of other caveats. One is that as once urine is collected from the cat, things start to change chemically with the urine. And the most important thing that happens is crystal formation. So once urine has left the body, you can actually start to get in vitro crystal formation in cats. Both struvite and calcium oxalate crystals may form when the urine is outside the body. And these are crystals that weren't in the cat, so it's very misleading. If you put the sample in the refrigerator, it enhances that effect. It's especially uh, common um, uh, with cats that have high concentrated urine. And you know a lot of your patients have urine-specific gravities that are very, very high. Now, this um, effect uh, of uh, uh, time doesn't um, make any difference to urine pH. It doesn't change specific gravity. It's really about crystals. So if you really want to know uh, whether a cat has crystal urea or maybe you're doing follow-up on a patient that had been diagnosed with a problem with crystal urea and now you're following up, you need to look at that urine sample. We need that cytology within 60 minutes. So that's not a sample I'm going to send to a referral lab, or, or I might, but I'm still going to look at the cytology in-house within 60 minutes of urine collection. So that's an important thing to remember. Here's another important thing to remember about cats and urinalysis, and that is we do want to look at urine pH, but if the cat does turn out to have a bladder stone, the urine pH is not a good way to predict what type, type of bladder stone is present in the cat. And that's because the urine pH today, at that moment in that urine sample you collected, may not actually accurately reflect the urine pH that was uh, 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 in place at the time that that stone formed. The urine pH 
can shift. Even There is actually even some data that shows urine pH can change between the cat leaving the house and coming into your clinic. So it's, it's a labile thing. Um, it's not a like carved in stone thing, urine pH. So I would be reluctant to weigh, um, lean too heavily on urine pH to help me predict stone uh, type. We're going to talk about other things to predict stone type. Okay, so that's the urinalysis, and, and at this point, I'm not really sure what Tommy has, but we do want radiographs. So I'm going to show you Tommy's radiographs. So here we are. I'll just show you the lateral um, in the interest of time. So hopefully, you can all see that, yes, indeed, Tommy does have a nice little collection of stones in there. So now our job is to try to figure out what kind of stones are they. And so here's where it's really useful to look at a struvite uh, versus calcium oxalate um, comparison because those are the top two types of bladder stones in cats in, in North America. There are other types, but they're a minority. So if we're ruling out or ruling in the two most common, it's struvite and calcium oxalate. So radiographically, they can look a little bit different. And probably the biggest clue for me is density. So struvite stones are, are radioopaque, but only moderately so, whereas calcium oxalate stones are very dense. And even when they're tiny, they're very dense. The struvite stones tend to have a smoother contour generally. Most of the calcium oxalates I see tend to be more irregular, and then the number helps. So struvites tend to be low numbers of stones. Uh, calcium oxalate tend to be high numbers of stones. So these are not set in stone, pardon the pun. You know, there can be overlap, but they are clues that, um, that help you. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples. Here's a kitty with some very obvious calcium oxalate stones. You can see there's a lot of them. You can see the density. And one of the things I look at for density is I compare the density of the stone to the density of the long bones. And if the stone density looks comparable to the long bone density, then I'm likely to think it's a calcium oxalate stone. And that's the case for this kitty. Here's another example. This is a kitty with struvite stones. So you can see that you, you can see the stones in there, but they're not as dense, right? They, they're not as dense as the long bones. Okay, so... So here's Tommy. We'll go back to Tommy's uh, image so you can just have another quick look at it again because I'm going to send another survey and I'm going to ask you to commit yourself now and I'm going to ask you to tell me what type of urolith do you think um, – uh, oh, hold on here. I think we may have the wrong – we're a little bit out of order. Hold on here. Let me go back. Our surveys are a little bit out of order. Here we are. Okay. Hopefully, you have the right one in there now. What kind of urolith does Tommy have? So, uh, do you think he's likely got a struvite urolith in there? Do you think he's got a calcium oxalate urolith in there? Um, or do you think it could be one of the uh, lesser ones and of the less common types, probably purine would be like number three on that list. Or you can still say, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not going to pretend that it's always perfectly easy to tell. It isn't perfectly easy to tell every time. Um, but hopefully you're going to make a guess for me um, with, uh, with Tommy. Okay, so I think you guys are really good at voting. So we're going to go ahead show you what your answers were. So almost 90% of you said, I think Tommy has struvite stones. And I'm going to agree with you. I agree with you that I think Tommy does indeed have struvite stones. I'm going to show you another kitty. This is Fresca. We're going to talk about her more in just a minute. So uh, you can see uh, Fresca, again, probably has calcium oxalate stones. She's got a larger number of stones in there. There's probably more than three to five, and they're fairly dense. So if we look at a cat like Tommy where we think he's got struvite and Fresca where we think she has calcium oxalate, we're going to have to have a different um, treatment plan. I did want to say a quick word about radiographs versus ultrasound because sometimes people say, well, which one should I do? And I just want to remind you that it's not either or. They do different things. So survey radiographs are, are really good at diagnosing bladder urolith. You can find them with ultrasound, but ultrasound will not help you guess the stone type. That's one of the big differences between radiograph and ultrasound. Ultrasound is good if we want to look at the bladder wall, if we're looking for anatomic abnormalities, if it's an older cat and we think there might be a mass in there. But when it comes to stones, the big difference is that radiographs um, are good for helping us guess what type of uh, stone might be in there. So here's a patient of mine and a pretty classic example of what a urolith looks like. It can help us find urolists that are not radiolucent. Now, again, in cats, mostly we see struvite and calcium oxalate, and they are, by and large, um, radioopaque. But if the struvites are very small, they might be hard to see. 
So here's a, a stone in this kitty, very obvious on ultrasound, but it doesn't give us a clue as to what kind. So you really do need radiographs to plan treatment because we're going in two completely opposite directions. If it's a struvite stone, we want dietary therapy, whereas if it's a calcium oxalate stone, we're headed to surgery. And I just want to remind you there's a really neat app from the Minnesota Urolist Center. So hopefully most of you have seen this. It's a free download on, the Google, on Google Play or in the App Store. And it has a section in there called Calculate that can help you figure out what kind of stone is in your patient. Okay, so now we're going to spend the last little bit talking about uh, treatment options because we've gone uh, quickly through how we're going to make a diagnosis of stones and we're going to talk about treatment options. So I do like to think about getting rid of bladder urolis in the uh, context of I always want the least invasive method for my patient. So if we go on this chart from least invasive to most invasive, least invasive is going to be medical dissolution. So that's going to be dietary therapy. And as of today, that's amenable to struvite only. Most invasive is going to be surgery. And I re reserve that for when we have no other options. And in the middle there are other options kind of depending on what you have available to you, what equipment's available, if a referral option is available that can do something like cystoscopy, if you're comfortable with voiding urohydropropulsion that's limited to just female cats with small stones. So there's a couple of options in the middle there that might catch a few more cats and prevent them from having surgery. Okay, so I want to point out to you that current data shows most stones submitted for analysis in both Canada and the U.S are struvite. So there's a slight edge. You know, they're close to 50-50, but these days struvite has a slight edge. Most of them that go into the Eurolist centers in Canada and the U.S. are struvite. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is that you can dissolve struvite stones with dietary therapy. So why are we cutting them out? Why are we sending them in for analysis? My goal is to make sure the percentage of struvite stones that go into these, these urolith centers drops every year because we're learning to do better with dietary therapy. So we're going to spend just a couple of minutes talking about dietary therapy to dissolve struvite stones. This is a study I point to um, quite often. It was done at the University of Minnesota by Jody Lulich's group, where they compared the Hills CD MultiCare to um, Hills SD, so a maintenance diet to a dissolution diet. And interestingly enough, they discovered that the, the maintenance diet, the CD MultiCare, was actually also able to dissolve stones. They got a 50% reduction in stone size in two weeks and complete dissolution within one month. And what's beautiful about that is that it means we can use one diet to both dissolve the stones and stay on maintenance therapy. You all know how hard it is to change diets on cats. So if we can skip uh, a dissolution diet step and go right to these maintenance diets and still get the same effect, that's great. So our current recommendations for struvite radio, uh, sorry, urolis are to change to a diet like CD as an example that is, a, and this is the one where we have published data on, and then re repeat your radiographs two weeks after the diet change. At that two-week point, you should see at least a 50% reduction in urolis size. If there isn't a 50% reduction in urolis size, either it's not struvite, so maybe your guess was wrong. Well, you know, all you did was lose two weeks of time. That's not the end of the world. Um, or the owner has not been compliant. So we need to go back and recheck and make sure the owner has been compliant um, with uh, your recommendations. So here's Tommy. We'll go back to his radiograph. There's the original one. Here he is three weeks after diet change, and you cannot see a urolith in that kitty. They are gone. So even these maintenance diets like CD MultiCare are pretty quick at dissolving stones. And one of the reasons is cats usually don't have UTIs. So their bladder stones are less complicated. They're quicker to dissolve. You do not need to be giving these cats antibiotics unless you've proven that they have um, a UTI. And remember, we talked that that's only certain populations of cats. Let's quickly go back to Fresca, who we said probably has calcium oxalate stones based on the number and on the density. She's a kitty who's going to be headed for cystotomy. So we're going to do this when there's no other options available. These are non-struvite and we have no other way to get them out. We want to make sure we do send these stones for analysis, of course, because that helps us plan. These cats are often repeat stone formers. So we want to do good follow-up. We want to reevaluate the cat periodically with urinalysis and bladder imaging. 
And I just want to remind you that cystotomy is not without its issues. We do see problems with incomplete urolith removal. Sometimes cats have dozens of little stones in there, and we can see problems with suture nidus causing urolith formation. So we have to be careful about that. That first three months after cystotomy um, is the time to be very, very careful because urolith recurrence within that first three months is most likely due to incomplete stone removal. That's a really important um, timeline to keep in mind. And it's why we always want to do post-op radiographs. So this is Fresca's post-op um, radiograph to make sure that we are indeed getting rid of all the stones. And then just to finish up, we want to prevent these stones. So we want to make sure that these cats are on an appropriate prevention diet because cats will be repeat stone formers. This is a really good resource. This is the 2016 ACBIM consensus recommendations for treatment and prevention of urolists in dogs and cats. And you can get it for free at acbim.org. Um, it's in their um, consensus statement uh, part of their website. So it's a free download. If you have not seen that, please go ahead and have a look at that. Okay, so we had a really quick gallop tonight through calcium oxalate and struvites, um, how common they are, what they look like, how you're going to diagnose them. Um, I'm going to make a plea to you to make sure you try the least invasive treatment method first. Let's try to get that percentage of struvite stones lower every year that gets sent into these urolis centers. And remember, you don't need antibiotics unless it's proven by culture. Most cats do not need antibiotics when they have urolis. So that's one of the reasons it's easier to dissolve urolis in cats than in dogs. Wow, the time went by really fast. Um, so <laughs> hopefully we have time for some questions. There's my contact information. I'm always happy to follow up with, um, with all of you um, afterwards if there's anything that we didn't cover because we only had a, a, a brief amount of time together tonight. So don't hesitate to follow up with me. I'm going to turn you back over to Felicia now for a minute. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Little. We really appreciate you giving such a quick, even though it's a quick, informative webinar, there's a lot of clinically relevant information there. And before we get to our questions, um, just wanted to reiterate that um, for all of you attending live tonight, um, make sure to check your uh, mailboxes. Um, within two hours, you should receive your CE certificate. If for some reason you do not, definitely um, send us an email and we'll make sure that we get that to you. Um, and then also, um, before I go back to the slide with Dr. Little's information, also at this time, want to invite our audience members to ask any questions they may have after the webinar um, and also to type in any feedback in that same question um, box for our speaker, for Vector girl um, or for the topic in general. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and with that, let's get to some of our questions. Um, I know you talked about uh, performing cystocentesis in, in your kitties and, and trying to find the most compliant way of doing it with each cat. Um, any tips on how to do, like, do you often do the cat standing? Like, I would do a dog standing, but um, is there a certain way that you would recommend restraining a cat um, in that position? Because typically I do my cats in lateral, and I think a lot of our audience members do as well, Dr. Little. Yeah, lateral recumbency is fine. I'm just going to go back to this slide and show you, you know, two kitties here, one who's in dorsal recumbency. That's a kitty who's actually quite comfy in dorsal recumbency. He's in one of those U-shaped troughs, so he's not flat on the table. But a lot of cats will panic a bit if they're on their back, if they're feeling stressed. So the kitty in, in the other picture is kind of mostly standing, and he's, he's being supported against the body of my assistant. Um, so I think you just tailor to the cat. You can do them in lateral. You can do them standing. I've done them kind of half sitting. Um, I've done them on the floor. I've done them on the table. Um, I think one good rule of feline medicine is you adapt to the cat. Don't ask the cat to adapt to you if possible. So however you and the cat work it out. So uh, hopefully we keep the cat feeling pretty comfy. Um, yeah, uh, be flexible in, in how you do your positions. Agree. With cats, you always have to be flexible with them because they kind of have their own mind with things. Um, so if, if you only have one diagnostic tool um, when you're doing something and you, you proceed with radiographs and it doesn't show any urolis in an adult cat, would you treat it as FIC? And w what's your preferred um, idiopathic cystitis treatment protocol? So sure, if it's a, a young cat especially, so it's not in that senior cat group where we need to cast a wider net for a diagnosis, and we don't see anything on screening radiographs, then your, next, your, your most likely diagnosis in that age group, about two-thirds 
of cats in that young to middle-aged age group with lower urinary tract signs will have idiopathic cystitis. So it's a good bet, you know, if your screening radiographs are negative. So there is good dietary therapy for idiopathic cystitis. So I'd always use dietary therapy. And then we also need to look at the home environment. So idiopathic cystitis um, can be a stress-induced disease. And a lot of that comes from looking at the home environment. Uh, so there's a really good website um, at uh, Ohio State that, uh, from Ohio State called the Indoor Pet Initiative. So if you haven't seen it yet, just Google Indoor Pet Initiative, and uh, you'll find the website from Ohio State. It has a dog section and a cat section, and the cat section has really good info on um, how to talk with clients about what a cat might need in its home environment to make it a, an, a resource-rich and to make it a healthy environment for the cat. So it's a two-pronged approach, diet, and then some investigation and some manipulation of the cat's environment for those idiopathic cystitis cats. Great advice, and I love that Ohio State University Indoor Pet Initiative. I do direct my clients to that website, especially when I'm dealing with a cat with cystitis, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, one of the other big questions our audience members have is when you are doing diet dissolution, especially if you're concerned about stuvite stones, how worried should we be about um, potentially dissolving these stones to the point where they might cause an obstruction, especially in male cats? Do you, are you concerned about that at all? Do we see that often? I love that question. <laughs> I just love that question. It gets asked every time. And so here's the thing. No, we don't see that happen. I know we all worry about it. And I know it's often a reason why people would take a male cat like Tommy to surgery, even though he has struvite stones and we can dissolve them probably in like two to three weeks with dietary therapy. People are worried about urethral blockage. So I actually asked Dr. Jody Lulich that question recently because I was hoping that uh, he, being the uh, lower urinary tract disease guru, would have the answer. And he said, no, he doesn't know what the answer is either. He's not sure why it doesn't happen. But he reminded me that if you look at all of the published studies on dissolution diets, and there's been dozens of them over the years, they all contain male cats and none of them report urethral obstruction when stones are dissolved with diet. So that's not a concern of mine. Um, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to touch wood as I say that, right? Because we're a superstitious lot in veterinary medicine. But honestly, I do not think it is, um, it's not a significant risk. It just does not seem to happen. So there's probably something going on there that we don't understand about the, I don't think the stones just like shrink smaller and smaller. My guess is they kind of literally dissolve away into fine enough particles that it, that it won't cause a urethral obstruction. That's just my guess. So we're not sure what the mechanism is, but the risk of obstruction seems to be extremely low. So that's good news. Oh, no, that's great news. That's good to know, because I know we always do worry about those male cats coming in black. Um, and then speaking of black cats, um, do you ever feel a cysto um, is at any point contraindicated with a obstructed cat? Do you ever feel that there's a risk of rupturing the bladder if, if you need to do a cystocentesis in a cat like that? Another question that I love. You guys are asking the best questions. So I love this question because when um, I do a lecture on urethral obstruction, I do talk about what's called decompressive cystocentesis. And I think for some patients, it's actually a life-saving procedure. So if we need to buy time for a severely compromised cat, we can empty the bladder by decompressive cystocentesis, and that allows us to get fluids going to stabilize the cat, to try to correct some of their metabolic abnormalities, and just make them a more stable patient before we go ahead and dive in and, and get working on relieving that urethral obstruction. There's been a couple of papers published looking at decompressive cystocentesis, showing it's an extremely low-risk procedure. So I don't do it in every blocked cat, but in blocked cats where I'm really worried about their status, they're unstable, I need to buy some time, I have no problem doing decompressive cystocentesis. And as a matter of fact, I think it actually can protect against bladder tear or bladder rupture, because if you have an, a, a very tense, a very full bladder, and now you're trying to flush the urethra, so you're trying to push fluid into uh, 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 a viscous that is full and tense, that's where your risk of obstruction, uh, sorry, of uh, trauma or tear or rupture of that bladder comes versus if we have emptied it by decompressive cystocentesis, there's no back pressure. So it makes it easier to 
uh, relieve the, ure the urethral obstruction. And I think it also, for some of these severely distended bladders, I think it actually reduces the risk of bladder tear or bladder rupture. So great question. Thanks for asking that. <laughs> I'm glad we're asking the questions that are on so many people's minds here. Um, and then one last question for you, Dr. Little. Um, if, do you find, I know we didn't touch on necessarily all the treatments for um, urethral um, idiopathic uh, cystitis, but do you find that in some of these cases when they are obstructed um, that prazosin is helpful for these kitties or with just regular cystitis where they have bladder um, or they have urethral spasms? So that's another good question. And I will tell you that I think the jury is out on whether prazosin actually is beneficial for, for cats. We don't have well-designed studies to answer that question. So there's some kind of contradictory evidence in the literature, but it's not, we don't have a study that really is well-designed to answer that question. So uh, I keep a couple of things in mind. One is that most of the feline urethra is striated muscle, and prazosin is a smooth muscle relaxant. So it does not have effect on most of the urethra anyway, even if it did work. And number two is drugs like prazosin or phenoxybenzamine is the other drug that is sometimes used for the same purpose. They can make cats hypotensive, and they can make cats feel kind of, you know, kind of crappy. They can make cats feel a little bit nauseous. They can make them feel depressed. They might not eat well. So I always check blood pressure if I use um, the drug. Um, and I always uh, see how the cat is tolerating. If they're not tolerating the drug well, um, if the owner's struggling to give the drug, like if, let's say we're giving it to a, a cat that's at home, it's a drug that I'll, I'll, I'll get rid of pretty quickly because at least at this point in time, we do not have compelling evidence that drugs like Prazosin help. Doesn't mean I don't use them, but I'll be pretty quick to get rid of them if I think they're causing a problem. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Little. Again, we really appreciate you giving another great webinar for Batgirl. And we also appreciate our audience members um, for attending tonight. So thank you all, and I hope everyone has a great night. Thanks, everybody. Good night.